Hello, and welcome to the Berkshire Innovation Center for tonight's panel discussion entitled The Rise of Crypto Capitalism, Crypto, Blockchain, NFTs, and Beyond. I am Ben Sosny, Executive Director of the BIC, and I'll be moderating our discussion led by this group of brilliant panelists. We'd first like to thank our sponsors for this evening, uh, Cinegex, who provides great IT services here at the BIC and to many of our BIC members, uh, Pittsfield Cooperative Bank, uh, supporter of many great programs in Berkshire County, including uh, educational programs we run here at the BIC, uh, Shire Brewhouse, who has a fantastic brew for everyone to enjoy tonight, themed uh, for the occasion, Jimmy Peak, who saves every summer for all of us, or every winter for all of us up here in the Berkshires, and... Uh, Brings a tremendous amount of great people to our area. Ryan Salome, who has done some amazing things in his own life and has brought those back here to the Berkshires, uh, making a big impact locally. And to Hamilton, Brooke, Smith, and Reynolds, intellectual property attorneys who have donated a really beautiful uh, wine and gift basket here that one of our uh, audience members will walk away from uh, tonight with. So all of you here at the BIC, Welcome. Although you streaming online, welcome. It is exciting to be gathering for events like these in person. Once again, hosting tonight's event here at the BIC is an honor. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your time. Our panelists from right to left are Justin McKinnon, co-owner and CEO of Coinbusters, uh, Giovanna Fessenden, counsel at Hamilton Brook, Smith & Reynolds, Chet Manikenton, founder and CEO of Skunk League, and Dave Nadig, chief investment officer and director of research at ETF Database. Um, they know much more about these topics than I do, so let's jump in and get this conversation going. All right. <laughs> Ready? <laughs> I heard a couple buzzwords that I that are that that resonated with me that I'd like you to get to dive in a little bit. Um, first word I heard was terrifying. Someone <laughs> said something is terrifying, um, and the other word was security, and those two things kind of go hand in hand, I'm sure. So I want to like maybe. Justin, because I know you've tried to explain this to me before, the security around how it actually works and how you feel secure. And then we can talk about some of these terrifying things, whether they're real or, uh, you know, they're, they're things we need to sort of look at and say, why, why not it's terrifying? So maybe talk about the security a little bit. Sure. I don't think you can talk about security or terrifying without intermingling the two. And it's definitely kind of how you view it. You know, in traditional banking, for example, I offload all of that risk to my banker or to my financial advisor, right? I take my, you know, my, my 401k every month, I give it to some person, and I assume they're going to do it okay. Well, um, you know, until pretty recently there, you're kind of doing this yourself. So the terrifying part is you can click a wrong button and that money disappears. If you, I mean, it's, you have to click several wrong buttons, actually. And it's, it's kind of a, I mean, I've done it. So I, I, I know exactly what seven buttons to click to do that if you want to know, but uh, but but from the security standpoint, what's really interesting is that these are all software companies, the bit, the projects, the Bitcoins, the Ethereums, the Avalanches, the Polygons. If you look at, you know, Crypto.com and, and all of those, these are all companies and they have networks and those networks are blockchains and you can't delete things once they're on the blockchain. If I want to send Giovanna one Bitcoin there, the network will make sure that I have one Bitcoin, that her address is correct. All of that is hard coded into it there. And that is deducted from my account, so I can't do it. And you'll see occasionally on the internet, like exploits and hacks. And that's just part of the growing pains, I think, of, you know, kind of the expanding use cases here. But from a security standpoint, you are, you cannot lose your cryptocurrency. No one can take it from you. The banks do not own it. You, you cannot be forced to do anything with it because it is just a number. There's no name tied to it. There's no, you can do some pretty sketchy stuff. The whole Silk Road thing from the early, you know, early in the, you know, teens there was, you could hire a hitman and you got to pay him in Bitcoin. I mean, that, that's the wild west. I think that's kind of come and pass. But, you know, in its current construct there, you know, even the IRS in its current configuration, they have no idea what to do with this stuff because I have a, I have a numerical address. I mean, I don't know, Matt, prove it, right? So, so you own access to it and that security is really powerful. If you take care of it, you can't steal it. It's not possible. How does that work? You're going to give one Bitcoin to Giovanna. Just focus a second on like that transaction very simple and how it's checked along the blockchain. Sure. So that's the concept of what we call decentralization. So it's probably easier to explain it conversely. So centralization means that a, a, a party that is, I would guess, somewhat not impartial. So they're a bank, for example, 
uh, the bank will have to go through all its own validations and verifications and, and make sure everything works there. Well, if the bank is like, no, nah, I don't feel like doing it. Well, you, sorry, you know, you're, 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 you're declined. Maybe uh, akin to you took too much money out of your ATM today, right? We've all run into that one before. You're like, well, wait a minute. I have, you know, I have money in the bank here and they make the rules, right? Well, the agreement on a network is the decentralized nature of it. It's got to be agreed to by more than and Bitcoin. It's 51% at a minimum of it. And the beauty of the security with that transaction is nobody knows where all of the people that make those decisions are. They're, they're unknown nodes that all have certain languages that they have to interact with with it. So for me to send a Bitcoin there, that goes from me into the network. The network broadcasts it to, I mean, a bajillion nodes. It's even, not even a real number anymore across there. And they do calculations. These are very complicated math algorithms. Cryptography is kind of what cryptocurrency is based on there. And it comes up with a unique answer. And then when that unique answer is found, it gets agreed to that, yep, you, you did your math correctly there. It gets uploaded. She gets credited with it. And then it's gone. It's no longer in my account. Did you so, miss anything? Well, no, you, you, you <laughs> said it well. I was, I was just going to say, so so the blockchain is, is a bunch of old technologies fused together. So you have a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, you have like a backlinked list, in, which is a structure in computer science. So it can only be written in blocks forward. You can't write, rewrite anything backwards. So that's part of why all those transactions are recorded in uh, such a perfect way that they can't be tampered with because it only writes forward. You can never write back. Um, and you have cryptography. Um, so those three tech and a consensus algorithm. So all different blockchains have different consensus algorithms. And that's the part that, you know, where you might hear people talk about the sustainability of, of um, cryptocurrency, because it does, you know, Justin was talking about all of these computers that are deciding whether or not to approve the transaction. These are um, you know, that that's part of the consensus algorithm for Bitcoin, but there are other types of consensus algorithms that are less resource intensive. Um, so that's, you know, really it is it, it, and when he was talking about whether or not it's terrifying, it's terrifying because you don't have like a trusted party that, you know, your bank in there, this is, you are dealing with this consensus algorithm to approve your transactions. And, you know, in your trusting, you know, that the blockchain is is working the way it should, which, you know, it typically does. But do you guys have anything more to? I, I mean, I'll, I, I use the word terrifying. So I'll just I'll, you know, <laughs> add to that. I mean, I think about this from an investor's perspective, because that's who I deal with most of the time. And if I sit at my Bloomberg terminal and I fat finger a trade and I accidentally trade a billion dollars that I don't have, and it's clearly way outside of what the pricing should be, there's an exchange who has rules that will help me unwind that fat fingered trade. Happens all the time. I mean, literally every single day, trades get wiped. In the blockchain world, that literally can't happen. Once that trade has been fully executed, that money has transferred and you're done. So the reason that that's terrifying is if there's something broken in the system, there's nobody whose job it is to fix it for anybody. So in the example, we were talking about NFT gaming, like the biggest one of the those games right now is called Axie Infinity, which is run by a private company. And that private company ran a private blockchain with, you know, and they licensed certain people to have access to it. And lo and behold, there were problems in their code. They didn't actually implement it as well as they thought they would. And they lost $600 million in one trade. So it, it basically wiping out the game and most of the financial stability of that whole company because they had an error in the code. Now, in the real world of normal finance, when you have a big mistake like that, their processes for unwinding it and assigning blame, to put it in a simple way. Barclays did this a week ago for the exact same amount of money, $600 million they blew up on their own balance sheet because they made a mistake. But in that case, there's a legal framework to say, well, wait, the investors were protected. That's Barclays' fault. Barclays gets to eat the 600 million bucks. So that's why it's different because the systems are incredibly powerful, but the whole structure we have around contracts and legal authority is just, I mean, it's literally evolving by the moment. And that's both exciting and terrifying. Yeah, I think in, in a way that is absolutely true. Uh, there are protocols being written to create insurance for, mm -hmm. for those kinds of situations. Of course, there are controls you can have in terms of like multi-signature wallets where 
one person cannot sign the transactions. Everyone has Oh yeah, to, lots of ways to solve it. Lots of yeah. ways to solve it. And those are methods that have been evolved over the last couple of years by, by mistakes and experimentation. Uh, but I think more, more than terrifying, I think it's, it's it demystifying. Like, you know, it's very, it's very mystical for a lot of people. Like, what is this whole thing? Why does this even make sense, right? I think the moment we understand it, that the feelings of terrified feelings, it goes away. Uh, I think for, that's been the case for everyone I know in the last seven, eight years that we've, we've been talking to. They were like, okay, I don't understand. I think this is this is all a Ponzi scheme to someone who's like now built. I've seen people who've, who used to come to my talks in 2018 now have running companies worth hundreds of millions of dollars because they understood the first principles, what what's supporting the ecosystem. So I think the more you learn about it, the more less terrified. One of the things right. yeah. I hear well, going to that first principles is like, why does this thing even have value? Because we all think it, it has yeah. value. <laughs> it's an right. agreement I mean, between it's everyone. It's speculative, Dude, right? it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so we talked about, I think you used the phrase, Dave, uh, real world versus not how. Or traditional finance. Traditional called, finance. Not real world. Yeah, traditional, traditional finance. finance. But I think it, 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 it made me think of real world. And I know um, people are very interested in real world examples. How can this be used either now or as Justin said, 10 years down the line, what are some real world ways brick and mortar places in a place like the Berkshires could start to see this be implemented? Um, I think there are a lot of real world things that are happening today, right? And if you think about it from a perspective of um, uh, people sending money to different countries, like I've seen people transacting hundreds of millions of dollars being sent from India to Singapore and you pay like ten dollars as a fee, right? And you don't you don't need anybody else to settle that transaction. It is a real world transaction. Right. Uh, when we say real world, what do we mean? Are we talking about physical, like physical world? Like all of our information is online. Pretty much everything we do is online. So uh, the economy now is being handled by intermediaries, and a lot of the intermediaries are now being displaced by protocols. And and you can think of any number of applications to do that. You can. Um, nowadays, you can um, not only in terms of finance, but you're also able to um, do meetings online. Like Zoom version of that is available in crypto as well, uh, and it's completely handled by by protocols. I don't want to name projects right now because that's going to confuse people. But the the bottom line is that today I'm able to do a lot of things um, with, using crypto that I was doing it before crypto as well. Right. Yeah, I think a great way to think about it is anytime there's a, a company that you associate with like, oh, I want to do a thing on the internet. I want to do a call, so I'm going to go use Zoom. I want to send money, so I'm going to use PayPal. I want to buy a book, I'm going to use Amazon. All of those people are intermediaries and an enormous amount of what they do is incredibly inefficient and can just be put into a smart contract and made to disappear. The thing that you can't really replace is the trust of the third party and the legal liability of the third party. And that's really the handshaking that's going on in the industry right now is, what do you kind of want a trusted third party for? And you know, you want somebody you know is on the hook. And what do you want to just get out of the way because it's going to be more efficient? Um, and you know, when you see the the scary headlines, it tends to be we stepped a little too far on one side of that line, and we're learning that. And what's what I what I always find to be really interesting there too is that all of these quote unquote security risks and things like that are are very real, right? I mean, I have money in this. I don't I don't want to lose it. Uh, but it's transparent. There is no hiding anything in the world of blockchain. It is all it is all out there. You can see the code. You can go into the contracts. You can see it. And as this, I mean, I've never seen an industry that's more friendly, right? I mean, you know, the everybody in the crypto space is generally forward looking. They want to grow the space together. And it's pretty exciting because if somebody does something sketchy, like you see a new project and there's like a lot of money that gets, gets moved around, right? We don't have, again, there's no third party overseeing this. You can kind of do whatever you want if it's in the code. Uh, it's really hard to hide that. And, and now as the market, you know, in the last three or four years in particular has matured, you can see people doing that and people are like, no, 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 they'll blow the whistle on it. And, and you don't need to trust those people. But if there's enough people that are invested with a common goal with it, it works out really well. And you know, to, to kind of further that point with, with one additional thought, I mean, 
you know, what, what really got me, you know, to, to really make the plunge and, and dive deep into this is that, yeah, I mean, there's financial impacts. It's cool. You like to make better returns than the stock market. You know, you talk about it at the party, it's pretty cool, but you know, in, in the next 10 years, uh, most of the, or in the last 10 years, I should say, and most people have dealt with a real estate transaction, right? I mean, we've, you know, refinancing my house is probably the third most frustrating thing I've ever done. I don't even remember what the first two are, but they're, they're on the list. <laughs> <laughs> and, and to do that, right. It should be very simple, right? We talk about trust, right? I have a credit score. I have a certain amount of income. My house is worth something. I mean, that's kind of it, right? There really shouldn't be too much more to it there. You know, do I own the rights to the house or, or whatever it is? And that is a contract. I'm literally manually signing a contract that says I checked all these boxes. And as a guy that writes software, I'm like, wow, this sucks. This is really like takes 30 days, 40 days. Somebody forgot a form. And what we're going to see, I mean, again, 2030, I promise you, you know, you can record it on here and replay this that their loan originators are not going to have jobs. I mean, that's going to be one of the first obvious ones to go because, right, it's an algorithm. They are manually doing an algorithm. If I input what my income is and, you know, what I can afford and my credit score and whatever other stuff goes into that there, all the bank cares about is yes or no, right? So I put it into a chunk of code. It spits out yes or no. We can do that in one minute. We're done. Here's your house. Yeah. The example I've heard people use, which I really like is travel agents, right? Yeah. We used to think we desperately needed a travel agent because otherwise we weren't sure we were actually going to have the right train ticket to get to wherever. <laughs> and now that seems like we're all smiling and joking about it. But 20 years ago, 25 years ago, the idea that you would just book your own plane ticket to like Spain was insane. And now the idea that somebody would get in the middle of that and charge me 5% seems insane and possibly illegal. So like, I think we're going to, we're going to, we're going to get there. Right. I think you're right. Loan origination is a perfect point. It's like 99% of the loans are just rubber stamped. Yeah. When I first moved to the US, I discovered this concept called title insurance. And I was like, why do you need insurance on title? Like you, you, you know, you don't, you only know you don't. Yeah. Right. And then it was, Pretty fascinating that the, the the centralized authority, which is guaranteeing that you own the property, is not even going to guarantee that you own the property, <laughs> which is which is amazing to me that we believe in that system, but we don't believe in a cryptographically encrypted system that cannot be broken. It hasn't been broken this this encryption algorithm for decades now. But anyway, that's just that's a sidetrack. But yeah, that's a great example. I appreciate that. Um, all right, Giovanna, let's get to some more challenges uh, with NFTs. That's fascinating in terms of IP enforcement. Is that an issue in the NFT space? Um, what are some of the other big challenges maybe in the NFT space and, and how can some of those be addressed? Right. So right now, I mean, the, 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 the potential for NFTs is huge um, in terms of royalties and what kind of rights you could be conveyed. But most of the NFTs now, um, are, it's not clear at all to me from an intellectual property perspective what rights you're getting, if any. <laughs> we just got to maybe just display, you know, if it's an image, if it's a, if it's a piece of art, maybe you can display it as your, um, uh, you know, for your avatar or something. But even that, I, it's not clear to me that you, you know, that you have any legal standing to enforce that right, uh, based on the fact that there's no. Right now, there's no contract that is a legal contract that you could have standing to go into court with on these NFTs. And there's lots of, I know people in the space that companies that are working on addressing this, um, but this is a, a problem and it's, is, I think it'll be resolved soon, but it's, um, you know, you can do it in one marketplace. You could have one marketplace that allows these contracts to be uh, made when you mint the NFT, when you create it. But uh, it might not follow uh, once it's traded onto another platform. Or, so um, it's definitely a problem. And I, I think it's a, uh, it, it will uh, clear up soon. But it certainly makes me feel terrified about <laughs> NFTs because I'm not so sure. You know, there's a lot of hype. But when it comes to something like, uh, you know, a very expensive asset that you think you're getting, it's not clear that, you, you know, there's, there's nothing there's no, from a legal perspective, there's nothing there that suggests that you have rights that can be enforced in court, whatever, uh, to, to, uh, to, to show what you own, because it's, there's, but I, again, I think this is a temporary problem. Yeah, I have something to say. Sir. So in terms of the market finds a price typically, right? So yeah. one of the key components of NFT is that there's a timestamp. So timestamp, if you created like a picture and then you minted it and 20 minutes later I did it, 
uh, Dave can know that it, that was the first one that I came after, right? So you can do certain kind of like, there are forensics, there are tools that are available to do analytics as well. So you don't need copyright law technically. So at some point you will realize that the one I minted doesn't have value because no one wants to buy it. So, and then that's how you find like free market, if you want free market capitalism, that is free market capitalism, which is where the market finds the price, naturally invalidating the need for arbitration or copyright laws to be required. That's the, at least the core first principle. We don't know if it's gonna be real, in real world, we'll have to see. I mean, you asked the question before, like what are any of these things worth, right? Yeah. And and you, you made the slightly off the cuff comment, well, it's worth whatever people agree it's worth, but that's, I mean, almost everything we trade and own is a psychological commodity. It's assigned value because two people agree on that's value at one moment in time, and then it's completely different the next moment in time. And, and one of the things I think has been so fascinating about NFTs is all of a sudden a whole lot of people learned they don't actually own the rights to the things they thought they already own the rights to, right? You buy a Ansel Adams original print, you don't have the right to go put it on a billboard, you own the print. That's right. what you bought. It may be the original, but you didn't buy the copyright unless you signed a very long contract assigning you all of those rights to reuse it and commercialize it. And that's what's been so fascinating is a lot of people immediately thought the NFT somehow was going to circumvent copyright law and everybody like I own this piece of artwork, I'm putting it everywhere, I'm using it in a movie. And you're like, people were like, well, actually, no, you didn't buy that. What you bought was the first print effectively of something. And yeah, first prints have value. I have first edition books at home that I assign real value to because I happen to be a book nerd, right? There are people out there who are huge Grimes fans. And so buying the NFT of her album, number one, has real value to them. So I think it's fascinating to see how this is educating a whole generation on copyright law. Right. Well, so with copyright, you get a bundle of rights. You get like the right to create derivative works. You get the right to display the work. You get the right to perform the work. So there's like a whole bundle of rights that you get. And so when you're getting the NFT, like for copyright law to, to work as it should, you have to explicitly, if you're going to assign those rights, it must be in writing. It is a federal requirement, federal law. So if there's no, you're, you're not getting the exclusive right when you pay you know, for a very expensive NFT to, to do any of those things because there's no contract conveying those rights. But I think that this, go ahead. Sorry, I was gonna say that you probably heard of this uh, DAO which tried to buy Dune, uh, the movie script. Yeah. yeah. You know yeah. that whole story. So it's pretty fascinating. So it was not even an NFT. So a bunch of people got together to form a DAO, like a decentralized autonomous organization to buy a copy of the, the screenplay, I think, of Dune, but they didn't buy the copyright. So they just have a copy of it. They thought that they bought the copyrights. So now they just have a copy that is useless. Right. I mean, it's, so it's right. pretty funny. I'm sure it's in a museum somewhere. It's gotta be a Frank Herbert museum. Right. right. <laughs> but I think that analogy applies exactly to, to yeah. the, what you're getting with an NFT. Yeah. And, but it also shows a huge opportunity um, as NFTs mature that to, to provide, you know, to be able to assign your bundle of rights, because that could be very lucrative to the author, to the artist, and also very easy for the, you know, the purchaser to get a whole, you know, to not have to deal with lawyers to, you know, if you do assign all of your all right title and interest to all your copyright in, in the screenplay on, as an NFT, that would be a really quick way to just handle the transaction and, and not have to, you know, negotiate and, you know, you could bid on it or, you know, so it's, it's a good way to quickly, um, you know, really grant some serious uh, intellectual property, but it's not being, it's not there yet. Yeah. So one other thing is that uh, network effects typically is sort of like the idea that uh, more people use it, more valuable it becomes or more useful it becomes, right? Zoom or Twitter or Facebook. So some of the movies that we probably remember, which were like became cult classics, but when they came out, people thought it was not a good movie, it failed. So uh, directors and actors signed uh, contracts where they took a small amount of money and they would get on the back end residuals as they call it in, in the movie industry based on the revenue collected in the box office. And these movies didn't do well, but they eventually they came out in the home box office or they were streaming and they made a lot of money, but the directors and the movie actors never made any money because they didn't have that ability. So you could technically do something like without copyrights in a smart contract, if it's an original artwork, you can create a, uh, uh, the royalty rules in such a way that even if you don't make money now, you can make money in the future if it makes money. Yeah, so even, those are some ways you can, advantages of smart contract NFTs without copyrights, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, the, the example, I mean, you mentioned this too, Giovanna, the idea of, of having royalties baked in, right? I know a lot of artists are very interested in that idea. Um, the challenge there is that the code doesn't really even quite work yet, right? It only right. works if you trigger it to do that, but I can still just hand it to somebody else without actually registering it as a royalty sale. So right. again, now there's again this, this third party, in this case, an exchange that's actually going to enforce that piece of the code. So again, it still seems so nascent. Right. Well, I think it's a huge opportunity because, you know, NFTs are still in their infancy, um, just like the Internet. You know, you had the World Wide Web consortium like there needs to be a consortium working with all of these marketplaces and with the exchanges to set uh, standards, mm -hmm. a protocol standard so that, you know, the royalties are enforced so that IP rights can be enforced. I mean, I think that that is what we need to see happen. And we get a lot more too. And and this is really what, you know, why most of us in here probably have heard of NFTs if you're not into the crypto space really deep is the social value of these things. And it's amplified to a degree that it's really unquantifiable. You know, uh, there's actually a billboard down the road there of, a, of an NFT called Board Ape Yacht Club, right? These are pictures of these like weird apes that are worth like several million dollars. And you're like, huh? It's not a Norman Rockwell. This is a computer image that there's a limited set of them there. And Right. It, it's it's supply and demand. There's only a set number of these things and you want the rights, which you got to pay a lot of money. And those in and of themselves mean nothing. You don't get any superpowers. You can't go to a concert with them there, but it's kind of a status symbol. And with the NFT market, that status symbol is on the Internet, is on social media. And that is where everybody lives. And and so if you're an artist, you know, we you know, across the industry, there's tons of people that you know, they make art and they exclusively sell them as NFTs and people pay real world money for these NFTs because they're trying to support the artist, right? It's transactional, but the social value of owning like a really, really cool piece of art, you get a little marketing behind it. You get Gary V or a big VC, you know, person behind it that says, Hey, these, you know, these creatures, NFTs are cool. They go vertical. I mean, they'll go from being worth $80 to $8,000 overnight. And, and that's really unique about the whole market. All right. I want to make sure we also include, um, questions from the room if they come in. And, and I know there's some folks joining us uh, in Zoom world uh, that uh, if you guys have questions at home, send them in on the chat. Um, Tim is going to uh, be manning that and has some questions. I think you have one already, Tim. Sure. Uh, Daniel Dardani asks, can the panel discuss the metaverse and what will intellectual property law be like in the metaverse? Trademarks in the metaverse seem straightforward, but what about patents and copyrights? I can start with that. Yeah. So, I mean, it, the, the first concept is like, you know, what is the metaverse, right? I mean, you see it on, on TV. Uh, if you have like an, I mean, the way I describe it is, you know, it's a, it's a VR world. If you ever played like World of Warcraft or seen the movie Ready Player One, I mean, to me, that's the metaverse. It's a world that's like just inside of a computer, but you can play with it, push buttons and interact with it there. And so if everybody's congregating in the same place, you can put information there. And that information is the same as an ad that you would get on Facebook or a web page. And it's super cool, right? I mean, anybody can access it from anywhere and nobody actually knows what it is. There's like several metaverses out there. And, but it's, it's really no different than a shopping mall. It's an online shopping mall, but you get to walk around, you know, at some point there'll be a controller, you know, that'll go through it there, but it's, it's all going to be occupied by the blockchain. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And I just want to say, uh, I believe that was Dan Dardani that made that, um, and he's he's also like a, a really amazing patent lawyer and is a, a, at the licensing office at MIT. So he's um, thank you for that question, Dan. That was a so, loaded question. Well, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so I think that uh, you know that in terms of enforcing your rights in the metaverse, I mean, and I don't know that they're going to be that different, uh, but they're than they would be in the real world, in in my view. Yeah, I, I'm just a couple quick things. So at Metaverse, I'm not a big fan of the phrase because nobody really agrees on what it means. If you Google my name in Metaverse, you'll find two or three articles I've written in the last few months about it and the fact that I hate the word. Um, but but it's, you know, it's, it's being used as a collection of interoperable technologies of which VR is certainly a piece, but it's also about data, data standards. Uh, it's about certain technologies, decentralization, but the very nature of it is this core of decentralization. And as soon as you make that the core of what you're building, any kind of property rights become very problematic because property rights without enforcement are meaningless, right? And part of the reason we like living in a particular country in a particular legal system is we kind of know somebody can't just camp in our house and get away with it, right? We know that there's a way to enforce your property rights. That's very difficult to do when we're talking about a global system that very often does not have any geofencing around it. 
And that's where I think it gets challenged. Right, no for sure. There's no police. Yeah, no one's going to come to your help. <laughs> Another way to think about it is they probably all of us are familiar with uh, DC Comics and Marvel, right? So back in the 90s, they were trying to sell, like create movies out of those characters. And they sold the rights to, I think, Sony or something for $40 million. And eventually part of it was sold to Disney. And they just had Spider-Man, which is the most popular comic, and people, they knew they could make a movie and they would be successful, but they had all these other characters, Thor, Iron Man, and all of those things. And they realized, from what I understand, is that they couldn't create individual movies, but they want to create a multiverse or sort of a, uh, a DC Comics world of different characters or Marvel's characters. And they built a $20 billion enterprise out of that whole thing because they made all of these different comics interoperable in a way. Like to your example, that there's so many data lakes, technologies, and uh, different kinds of services, but if you can make all of them interoperate, just the way we do in real economy, that is the value. For lack of better words, people call it metaverse because it sounds cool and uh, <laughs> it's, it's all made based on metadata, really. So that's the idea. I don't know if that helps. So I see a question there. Um, Kate, can, uh, just hold on, Chris, one second. Kate's got a microphone if you want to. Oh, yeah, I was just wondering if any of you could comment about the question of energy consumption related to blockchain. Yeah, sure. So uh, sustainability or, you know, uh, there is like a desire, whether it's blockchain or any uh, technologies to try to be close to carbon neutral as close as you can. I mean, that's important um, in, in general. I think that there's sort of a consensus moving. It's, maybe it's not uh, as strong as it will be in maybe 10 years from now. I think 10 years from now, we're going to see more companies trying to be uh, sustainable or, or close to content uh, carbon neutral. But for blockchain innovations, I have I have clients in working in that space trying to uh, uh, create um, the sort of proof of work consensus algorithms that are are more efficient in terms of with the type of uh, computational resources they take because as um, uh, we were hearing that you know when you have a peer-to-peer -peer network and you have many computers trying to make the decision and 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 come to a consensus about approving a transaction like you would see in Bitcoin, that takes up a lot of uh, com computational resources and, and energy overall. So there are ways to that that com companies are trying to figure out ways to approve the transactions without using uh, using different types of uh, algorithms. Maybe not proof of work, but uh, maybe proof of stake or uh, might are less are less resource intensive and there's a lot of drive by the people that are doing the transaction validations in the networks themselves to move away from that because the second exactly. largest cryptocurrency in the world is ethereum and i hate ethereum right it, it, as a guy that uses it for me to transact my data on there it gets real expensive because everything has to be validated and calculated that takes time you can only do so many at a time and uh, that drives up the network costs at the same point as it drives up your electric bill. And so Ethereum is undergoing a, a change to go from this proof of work consensus to proof of stake that says, I own so many Ethereums, I get a certain percentage of a vote on whether something is okay. And a vote rather than a calculation is very, very efficient in terms of energy consumption. So I guarantee you, I don't know if Bitcoin will ever change because nobody really runs Bitcoin anymore. It kind of just <laughs> kind of just does its thing. But you know, the, the all of the next generations there are making iterations that are getting more and more efficient for sure. So one other thing is, I'm sure you probably read about this online, is that proof of work, uh, majority of the energy consumption comes from latent and untapped energy sources. Most of the mining that has happened for historically, it was like in places where hydroelectric power was available, but it could not supply the energy to the, to the main grid. So they were actually setting up mining facilities closer to those, those places. So Having said that, uh, another thing to think about is like the Nokia phones 20 years ago, you charge it for 20 minutes, it would last four days, five days, because all you did was call. But your smartphones today, you charge it for four hours and it lasts eight hours, right? You do more things with it. So there's more energy being consumed. The same way a lot of things that is happening right now with the crypto, whether it is Bitcoin or Ethereum, we're doing so many things with that. We're sending data, we are transacting, all of that. It does consume energy. Now, the core, core function here is not about whether Bitcoin or Ethereum consumes energy. It's like, can we uh, invest in sustainable energy sources because we will continue to consume more energy because we're doing more things with our devices. So I think that's where the focus is rather than the consumption. I think the, the real problem is the generation of power. We need to focus on that. And 
That's just my opinion. I, I think it's also a very now problem. Right. Uh, you know, the, the, this is network effects work here too. The more this becomes part of everything we're doing, the less you'll even be able to identify, aha, crypto mining is costing X because it's also where you're processing all your credit card transactions. So right. like you're going to, it's going to bleed together so quickly that I think uh, we won't even be talking about this in three or four years. Yeah. Steven had a question. So I'm all for getting the inefficient, bloated, large corporations out of the conversation in so many ways, because I've seen that happen in many ways. But I've worked with enough computer scientist students. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, I've been a professor. And so now what we're doing is taking the responsibility and the trust and the respect for large corporations and put it to a bunch of hackers who work 24 hours a day, trying to, not just hackers, but coders. But let, so we're not taking away the personal responsibility for society. We're putting it to a bunch of kids who just like to sit there all night long. And so I don't know, maybe I just don't understand it, but was people are people and there are nasty people and, and illegal people. And if we just put it into the coder's hands, I don't know if I feel comfortable that they're controlling everything. And just because the CEO of, you know, Facebook is out of the conversation, there's still a bunch of coders making decisions. But we, but if you're from computer science, you know the example here, which is the open source movement, right? The vast majority of technology in the world now operates on open source software. Right. And right. that that was written by, you know, hyper caffeinated coders at the age of 18. Right. Right? That's where that started until it became something that corporations relied on. And then they started really validating the open source. But it was possible because it was open. And I would I mean, if you want to play in it, go if you're a computer person, go learn how to code in Solidity, which is the native language for Ethereum. It is very simple. It's one of the simplest programming languages you've ever learned. If you've learned one, you can learn it in a, an evening. It's relatively easy to validate a smart contract just by being a basic level coder. You can you can run through it and be like, yeah, this is 28 lines of code. I think I understand what's going on. Where it becomes problematic was when you start building multi-billion dollar ecosystems and nobody's doing that validation. That's the error. That is human error is always going to be a problem in an open source situation. And the more people use it, the more people will validate it, and then the more secure it will be. Right. And so like pure blockchain systems are peer-to-peer. -peer. And uh, so they're not a private network. And it's, you know that's where you run into problems like with Axie. Yeah, Axie was a money. private network, so it was not it, open source. So it's not a true blockchain. True blockchains are peer-to-peer -peer and are open source. I mean, that is, a, that is one of the tenets of uh, you know, blockchain technology. So Bitcoin, you know, you, you were worried about all of these coders all over the world. Well, it, the, all the code is available for us all to see. So it's transparent. It's completely transparent. And these miners, it's not just one. I mean, these are, you know, hundreds of thousands of miners, you know, approving transactions or, you know, th th these are not, it's not just one and they have no control over whether or not uh, they're going to approve the transaction. It's just running like a bot on their computer and checking and validating signatures and making sure that the, you know, that the, the that the, uh, that everything is as it should. And when one computer, one one miner approves it in the next and that all of them have a consensus, a perfect consensus, the transaction will be approved. And there's there's an entire, you know, as, as an investor in crypto, right? That's, that's I think, where you're going to see the most dynamic kind of uh, change in the industry. And it's actually happening right now. As someone that's going to invest in it, I'm not going to buy something that's risky. You know, I've taken my lumps and tried to buy small projects, right? You, something's really tiny, it gets big, you can make a lot of money. Not usually what happens. Uh, but they have companies out there that are that are, are companies there. They're real companies of these computer coders that will go and they get paid by the project to demonstrate that that contract is secure. They will try to break it and they will provide all the vulnerabilities. Again, it is open source. It is out there. There are companies like Chainalysis and Coinglass that will go out and do research on how the networks are being used and they they point out vulnerabilities. Uh, Certic is an auditing company. Um, I will not invest in a project that does not have a Certic audit. I won't do it because Certic is, again, it's a third party trust issue there, but they're going through and doing that. So it is, you know, there is the wild, wild west out there. And, and there are some folks, you know, I've done it myself where you like to gamble a little bit and you can do some really cool stuff. And, and sometimes you get lucky, but for the vast majority of the use cases there, we're not talking about investing in things or, or using technologies that came out last night. Like I need to see a little bit of runway with it. And I want to know someone's checked it out. All right. I saw a question, Greg. Oh. Thanks. Uh, I'd like to just follow up on that and really, uh, 
ask the question, where is the investment? You say crypto, but there's also blockchain. And I think there's a distinction between those. I had a friend who uh, was running for a political office and he said, hey, uh, he ran on a buy a crypto platform for, excuse me, for pensions. If he wasn't elected and if he had done it, he'd probably be flat. This was three or four years ago. Um, you have the, uh, the market street people who talk about, as you mentioned, hey, you can take your lump sum sort of things, you know, one coin comes, the other goes. Uh, the, the other gentleman who called about the metaverse, and I know some people feel that confusion a little bit there, <laughs> but you have people like um, J.P. Morgan that buys property there. Can somebody else get their property? Uh, or is the investment in, uh, like you said, the security or a coder or a lawyer? Because you, you're not flipping money anymore in Bitcoin. It's an investment like, like any other. So I'm curious where the investment is. Is it in um, all those kind of the, the coders? No. Can you uh, talk about where the, 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 the proper investment would be, and not for overnight, for 10 years, and there are some young people here for 20, 30. It's, it's so much more, I think it's so much more simple than that. You know, networks get validated, um, you know, by people operating, whether it's miners or, or stakers or whatever it is, depending on the network type. And the investment is in the utility of the network, right? When I buy Ethereum, Ethereum is not a thing that you hold. It is the software code that lets people write software programs that can then transact on it, they can operate in it. And now there's all sorts of different instances of this that have their own pros and cons. Some are faster, some can do more transactions. So the investment is in the growth of that because there's only so many tokens that are required to transact on that network. So I need Ethereum to pay for my transactions, right? People are calculating and they're doing things. I'm not gonna donate my electricity for free, right? I have to pay for that. So as a miner, I get paid for that. And that, that is how, that is where the value of Ethereum goes because there's only so many of them. So supply and demand, you have more demand, same supply price goes up and that's where the investments really come into play. But, it, but I think your point's a very good one. This distinction between what is a coin, like cryptocurrency, that phrase by itself, versus all the things people are doing with blockchain, like they, they don't actually have to exist in the same conversation mm -hmm. at all, right? Ethereum, when you buy ETH, when you buy ETH, you're buying the utility coin to do work in a network. If you don't have any work you want to do in that network, then you don't personally see any value in it. But if you're trying to build something or you're trying to mint an NFT or you're trying to do any of number of the things that are getting done with that network, then you need ETH to be able to use the network. It's the coin of the realm quite literally. Um, and most of the cryptocurrencies we talk about have some connection like that. They tend to be the coin of an ecosystem to do work in that ecosystem. Whether or not that ecosystem has any value is really the investment decision that you need to make if you're going to invest in that ecosystem. Well, yeah, so, so XRP is an example of a network that was designed to create high liquidity for lots of transactions because Bitcoin is notoriously slow, right? You're never going to run credit card transactions as Bitcoin transactions, right? The throughput isn't there. So XRP and Ripple and other versions of that were designed to create another layer to do faster transactions at smaller values, right? Bitcoin's great if you want to move $100 million. It's terrible to buy coffee with. Right? But XRP could be a great way to buy coffee. If you could get enough network adoption of it, then people would want it and then it would have some inherent value. Paul, I saw a question here. Yeah, let's just put in on Stephen's issue there. Can any of you shed any light on the FBI investigation about a month ago in New York of that couple who absconded with millions and millions of Bitcoin and apparently the FBI retrieved about 50% of it? I think yeah. they retrieved all of it, actually. Yeah, they get all of it, yeah. yeah they get everyone yeah, of it, the yeah. Department of Justice loves cryptocurrency. The SEC may hate it, but the Department of Justice loves it because it is fingerprinted it's more accurately than anything else in the financial system. I have friends who work in a financial crimes unit, and they're just like, oh, my God, please tell me that the next kidnapping <laughs> is going to take Bitcoin because we're all over it because it's a public blockchain. They can follow these things around, and yeah, maybe that wallet address, you can't say, oh, that's Bob in Des Moines but they're very good at figuring out where those transactions happen from. It doesn't mean that bad actors can't get around it. And I'm sure there are people out there doing bad things and not getting caught. But so far, a lot of the things that people have tried to get away with, they have not gotten away with because it's on the blockchain. Yeah. 
And even more, what's what's even funnier is that, you know, we're not at the point where, you know, like you said, we're not going to buy bit coffee with a Bitcoin or anything like that. I don't really buy much with Bitcoin. There's some Tesla stuff going on here there. So my value in Bitcoin, if I need to pay for something, I got to go back to USD. And that goes through a place where you are tied to. You can't hide there either. Dr. Michaels, did you have a question? Yes. I just want to thank you for this very timely conversation because like an hour ago before this, I was talking to a patient, a well-to-do patient who told me that her um, bookkeeper fell in love with a man uh, that uh -oh. she met online <laughs> who convinced that uh, bookkeeper that he needed money because he was stuck in Germany and he showed oh, photographs of the terrible abscesses on his feet oh. and um, then uh, instructed my patient's bookkeeper how to transfer Bitcoin to him, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So I'm this couldn't come at a better time. And uh, I'm, I just heard Department of Justice. So literally, I just hung up on, you know, wasn't it, at four to five talking to her. So uh, I'm wondering what this is. I, they, you report it the same way you report it the same way you report any other financial yeah. crime, right? Which is you go to the FBI. Um, and unfortunately, if this is somebody who's actually out of the country, the chances that they'll be able to do anything about it are very small. The people who've gotten nailed for the most part have been US citizens. Sometimes they turn up though. They make a mistake of yeah. taking that Bitcoin, converting into some sort of a fiat currency somewhere and they'll show up. That happens a lot. Right. Especially if it's in a uh, treaty country with US, you can extradite those people yeah. and find that. It, Eventually yeah. it has to come out of the ecosystem to have much value because of the point you made, like except for maybe buying a Tesla, there's not much you're going to do with the Bitcoin itself. You got to turn it into something. And that means you have to run through an exchange. And in most countries in the world, those exchanges are actually regulated or at least monitored, right? And so there are ways to track some of this stuff. Obviously, there are ways around it. You can split things out into a thousand different wallets and then wait for a long time. But like, that's just crime, right? I mean, people have been laundering money for a long time. <laughs> And, and, and there's been a lot of high profile cases over the years, especially in the nascent times of crypto with exchanges that have billions of dollars and they get hacked and they lose it. And in almost all cases, they were able to find it because again, it's a paper trail. You can't hide it. It goes from wallet A to wallet B and all the exchanges are like, hey, probably shouldn't, uh, shouldn't hang out with wallet B over here. They're kind of bad. And then they're stuck and you can't do anything with it. You know, and so at that point you end up doing something dumb, trying to offload it or you know, you send it to your friend and then they get in trouble. So it's it's really, really hard to hide it. Here, we got a question in the front here. Okay. Yep. We don't need it. I got a couple of questions, actually. You said uh, blockchain um, is just all data, but isn't that data controlled somewhere? Does somebody control that data? Is it on a server somewhere? So, uh, so there, with when, the true blockchain, the original blockchain, like, uh, Bitcoin is on a peer-to-peer -peer network, so there's no server, and so that there's no middleman. That's that's the sort of the thought is like eliminating, you know, a, a central server from controlling all the transactions. So in a peer-to-peer -peer network is just uh, you know c computers, you know, interfacing with other computers in a huge array of computers. So there's no central. Uh, processing unit that is making decisions. Well, but you can but, download the software on your on your system. You can set up your own node, and you can download the entire blockchain, yeah. so to speak, and you can examine it yourself. Yeah, if you set up a blockchain node on your laptop, the first thing it does is download every single transaction ever done on the Bitcoin blockchain. See in three days. And you can. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it's, it means yeah. terabytes, and it yeah. takes time, but right. it's not infinite, right? right? It's it's totally do. I mean, I have one running in my basement. It's not. It's totally doable. So if the power goes out for the next year and a half, I have a copy of the blockchain as of when the power went out that is as good as anybody else's. So I can verify what transaction you made eight years ago. And a quick question about the gamification of Bitcoin, NFTs, et cetera. Other than inside Fortnite or however people make money from video games, what are other ways people gamify this technology? Uh, I guess gamification is at the core of most of what we do in modern economics, like you collect points in your credit cards or air miles. So there are a lot of different ways people are incentivizing people to participate. You can, there are sort of gamified mechanisms to uh, what is called staking and yield farm. So um, gamification sort of gets a bad rap because it sounds like it's a game, but it's really just a way to make it simpler and easier for people 
to engage with a very complex um, system. So even our phones, iPhones are very much gamified in many ways because it's very simple. You can interact with it in so many easy ways. Um, as of now, most of the gamification is primarily focused on like the ones that you described, Justin described like Fortnite and uh, NFT games and stuff like that. We will see more and more uh, corporations coming into the ecosystem where their trademarks are being allowed. You can virtual walk through and sort of buy Starbucks coffee and then that gets, you know, you can go pick it up and stuff like that. Those are some of the ideas that are being floated right now. Yeah. Um, but another, yeah, another good use for games for blockchain, of course, is wagering. So true yeah. for esports and for tournaments. And I mean, they do that now on Fortnite. Um, you can wager on your 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 game or others, others that are quite good. And, you know, you can earn coin. <laughs> and, and big money is behind it, right? Everybody's here heard of, you know, DraftKings, right? They have a, they have a partnership with Polygon, right? So a, a major, you know, one of the largest, you know, I forget where they are, one of the top 25 cryptocurrencies in the world. They have a billion dollar partnership with them to do that very thing. I make a bet it's on the blockchain. You, I can, there's no arguing your bookie's not going to say, no, nah, I didn't get it in in time. Right. You know, so, so get rid of your bookie and do it on the blockchain. <laughs> um, I, I got a couple from the audience. I want to make sure the people at home got a chance. So, um, Tim, you want to give us one here? Uh, yeah, this is a little bit more of a technical question and less philosophical uh, from Andrew Skinner. In the case of using blockchain for medical data, how is my medical privacy protected on the blockchain where the, when the security of the blockchain depends on its various copies being publicly comparable to verify that nobody is altering any instances? So the blockchain itself doesn't have you know, the medical records, they would have, um, you know, be able to, you know, one example implementation would be, it would, you know, you'd have like a, a token that would control access to your documents, but it doesn't, it wouldn't actually contain a copy of your documents. It can though. It, if it's an IPFS, it can be stored on the network, but it's encrypted. Right. But this is, but this gets to the point of like the fact that you can stand up the entire blockchain on a laptop right now obviously you can't do that if what you're trying to do is the library of congress right there, there there's this issue of how rich do you want the blockchain to be because the richer you make it the more expensive it is to run the right. more hardware right. you need so like in the case of private blockchains which are a big deal in traditional finance right now like all of vanguard's index data is available in a private blockchain every single corporate action for every single security that's huge we're talking tens of terabytes just to keep up with the daily flow of the data that's, that's not something that everybody would stand up. But medical records is a great case where maybe your medical records are actually in 400 different places, but you have the keys. And the right. key thing is whether you control who gets access to that public encrypted data. It's a, it's a, a username and password is the same implementation of it, right? I, I can, you can know my username, you don't know my password, you can't get in. You can know my password, you don't know my username, you can't get in. And so if I control that key, I control who can see my data. And that's exactly how it, it'll end up working for sure. I think I saw one up front. Yeah, here. Yeah, so um, I have a question about, um, and I'll go make some of the questions about long-term investments with um, blockchain technology, so specifically with NFTs. So using the example earlier, of like a first edition book, um, if I get a first edition book, you know, 30, 40 years down the road, I can have someone sort of verify that across multiple dimensions to say, you know, I know this is legitimate because of the typeface that was used because of the specific uh, paper that was printed on. Whereas with um, something like um, blockchain technology, um, you know, there's people talking about maybe, um, you know, 30, 40 years down the road, we'll get to a place where quantum computers can break through some of the algorithms that are being used for it. Um, so, whereas, you know, down the road, you might be able to validate, you know, say again, a painting or something like that using those multiple forensic dimensions with an NFT, it's really just the cryptography and that's kind of it. So what would you guys say to someone who's maybe a little more skeptical about the long-term, um, viability of NFTs in that regard as an investment? I mean, I would say it depends on what you want to do with it there. You know, as someone that, that invests, you know, heavily in the space, I love it, right? I, you know, I live and breathe it there. You know, I'm not going to be the person to go buy an original Van Gogh NFT. I'm just not going to do that. And and I would not advise really. I mean, you get the money to do a power to you. I mean, I don't. But <laughs> it's it's definitely uh, a concern because we know so little about the future, right? We can't predict, like you said, quantum computers can come in and wreck blockchain. I mean, I don't think it's going to happen. But I mean, crazier things. We didn't think blockchain was going to be what it is right now five years ago. Uh, so if you make an investment expecting to hold it for ten years. 
uh, you should look at your 401k, right? Everybody's going to hold that till they retire. Uh, your, your financial advisors, whoever manages it, they make stuff all the time there. So you should, you know, prepare to be liquid, I think is the, the right approach. But the, the, the key issue of like, is all of this susceptible to an advance in computing? Sure, right? Yeah, I mean, if, if ubiquitous mm -hmm. quantum computing shows up tomorrow, a whole lot of stuff breaks. Not just crypto. Yeah, that's not going right? to be the I first mean, one like, they shoot the off the ledge. The control system goes down. I mean, like ubiquitous quantum computing would radically alter what we think of as the internet forever and would never go back. I think it's probably unlikely that those kinds of things are going to happen in step functions that we don't know. Quantum computing will exist. It does now. It will be the foundation of state actors for a long time before it gets to the point where we start worrying about it. So does that mean that China will be able to hack your encryption to be able to steal your Bitcoin? Probably before the mob will. Yeah. Um, <laughs> is that something I'm worried about before I die? No. I guess specifically then, is there like, would there be a mechanism as we continue advancing those steps to then update? Yeah, repackaging, which is which is what yeah. we've done all, yeah. like with all encryption so far, right? I mean, most of the NSA stuff was built on elliptic curve, which then they realized wasn't so great. So they <laughs> moved to something else, right? Before all of our state secrets were leaked to everyone in the world. So generally these things are predictable enough that the folks that really have to care about securing data can get ahead of it. And all the cryptos have, you know, I guess the equivalent of a board of directors. Most of the major projects do. They're, you know, they use the term DAOs. So people that are, you know, they're incentivized to operate, it, but nobody really owns it, you know, so they, they kind of shepherd it there. And again, open source code Ethereum is going through it right now. The Ethereum Foundation sort of manages it there and they're always improving it and adding new stuff. They implement, you know, proposals and the company, you know, everybody in the network gets to vote on it based on how much you own, so how much weight you carry there. And so it's, yeah, I would wager that the technology that is in blockchain will scale with the complexities of stuff going against it for sure, if it's this popular. I mean, just think of what happened with the encrypted internet, right? We used to just put our credit card numbers in and not think about it. And now you wouldn't be like, your browser wouldn't let you if you didn't see that little lock in the corner. That didn't exist 10 years ago, not the way it does now. So this stuff does evolve pretty quickly. I think it also is, a, one of my clients has a blockchain based appraisal service. So I think that, appra you know, that sort of uh, market will may perhaps be huge. If you are in the market for buying a Van Gogh, there might be, you know, an authenticated appraisal that is attached to the NFT um, in order to 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 and insurance authenticate and it, storage and yeah, yeah. I mean, there's an ecosystem that's going to get built. Yeah. Right. Over here. Hi, uh, my name is Roger Mcgee. I'm a photographer, so I'm a supplier. So I have beautiful images and represent beautiful images that are known around the world. Where do I go from here, and where, how is value assessed, and how does it become? It's all supply and demand. There's no, there's no other way to it. Uh, if you, so the the most popular NFTs are not the coolest NFTs. There's one that's literally just a squiggle that like my my three year old could have drawn. It's uh, that's I think it's the rarest and it's worth like nineteen million dollars right now. And you're like, huh? It's it's like I mean, you probably made that mistake with ketchup on a plate with a French fry at some point, and and it's it's art. But in reality, you digitize it. You can go to any one of the major marketplaces right now. There's a place called OpenSea, is a very popular one. Uh, there's Looks Rare and a handful of sites there. And you can upload it and it's really streamlined. You type in like what you want to call it, what you want to sell it for, and then it's up to you to, to market it. It's really all it is. Yeah, it's all network effects, right? So you, you look at the projects that are successful that become huge and we read about, to your point, it has very little to do with the creative content, in my opinion, at this point. It has everything to do with the social engineering, right? Creating an ecosystem, creating artificial scarcity, leveraging social media platforms. That has nothing to do with whether or not you're a great photographer. It's an entirely different business. Crypto.com, for example, is a very, very big crypto website, and they bought the naming rights to a stadium, you know, so the Crypto.com arena, and it doubled in value because of the visibility for it there. So that serves as a data point. The currency does nothing new. It just its names out there a little <laughs> bit more. <laughs> One up front here. Um, I tried to do some NFTs, and um, you know, to do them, you have to have yes um well you can create all you need is a wallet you don't have to use any coin so on OpenSea, you can create uh, you have to have a crypto wallet but you can create an nft and um it doesn't they don't charge you but they will take a you know, a portion of the fee. It's like eBay would. Yeah. You can create it, but you can't really put it out there. Yeah. 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 Ye
in our mind, we put it on the internet, and also have some kind of like currency in there. Yeah, you have to have an, a wallet attached and right. yeah you can you can mint it i mean you can put it out there but nobody once somebody buys it then then right. you're right. going to get the ethereum so you have to have a wallet to put it so if i if i mint this you know my my name tag here right? i can go take a picture of it i can go to OpenSea right now i have zero ethereum in my wallet i can create the nft and i can put it for sale with no money in that wallet and the thing is is that i can't buy someone's nft without ethereum in that case or polygon whatever network you're on but somebody can buy my nft and if they buy it for one ethereum i'm going to get one minus whatever open seas fee is or whatever on there and that's where they take it right so you don't you need the the crypto wallet just so that they have a place to put your nft that you just created but you don't need no, no, not to sell it. No, not to sell it. Not to sell it. So it, it's going to live there until it's sold. Then it gets transferred. It's called lazy minting. Yeah, they, they didn't use. So, so when you did it, you may have you may have gotten it early because they didn't do that originally, and they found out that it costs. You know, Ethereum's busy. It's like four hundred dollars to mint a picture of your cat. You're like, oh, maybe maybe I'm not going to go do that tonight. Maybe we'll, we'll try that later. You know? <laughs> I'd buy it. I like that. I, I want to just apologize to any audience members at home who can't hear the questions. We're trying to do our best to get out there, but. Um, to sort of level set that maybe I'm going to take a, a, a question from the uh, home. Another from Daniel Dardani. Uh, the decentralization of crypto is touted as a major advance for the people and the democratiz democratization of finance. But what does it mean to the world once regulations and regulators have no more control? Look at current events. How would the world sanction Russia's economy if the traditional keepers of the vault have no say in how money is moved between companies, individuals, or governments? The threat is real. Yeah. No, it, it, it's 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 right in front of us, right? I mean, we have we have both examples happening in Ukraine right now, where you know they, the Ukraine raised an enormous amount of money using cryptocurrency, and at the same time, we're concerned about Russia evading sanctions using cryptocurrency, right? So we have both sides of that coin right in front of us. You know, the short answer is welcome to the regulation because it's going to come, right? And we can talk about you know wanting to have a decentralized world but the reality is you live in a country and you probably pay taxes and they probably fund an army and that's what currency is based on and without taxes and force countries don't exist so regulation is coming hopefully not awful regulation but i'm not super sanguine about that i, I do want to say something about the 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 russians and in uh, um, evading uh, sanctions if, we, if an oligarch wants to move a lot of money um chain analysis you can use to actually figure out somebody is moving money, but at the same time you need liquidity. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to say that I want to send a billion dollars from out of Russia, you need to find a counterparty who's willing to do that. So it's very incredibly hard to move billions of dollars, but it's helping a lot of average Russians who want to emigrate, get out of the country, who don't want to support Putin, to be able to take their wealth out uh, in a safe way. So in a way, I think, do we want to prevent average Russians being from being able to do that? Maybe not. We definitely want to prevent oligarchs from being able to do that, but that is taken care of by the, the market forces itself because you won't find a counterparty who's willing to or able to provide that kind of liquidity. And, and even we, we if can't you see did, the you can actually- future with it. You know, it's, it's, you know, you'll, you'll, have a, you'll have an identifier, right? Right now everybody's anonymous on the blockchain and they call it KYC, you know, Uniswap, one of the big exchanges. No one's on. going to touch your money, right? If you're yeah. an oligarch sending a billion dollars, I'm not going to even provide liquidity. It's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, you just can't do so, it. Yeah. Bad actors want to exchange value. Yeah, hey, go right ahead. <laughs> right, right. But at some point, it'll be tied to a name and a, and a person there. I don't right. want to predict, I can't predict the future there, obviously, but a very likely regulation that will come in is you're not going to be quite as anonymous as you think. And of course, you'll have to pay taxes and blah, blah, well, blah. And, and, there, but... and in the places where we have some forward thinking regulation, I would highlight Germany, the EU in particular, there are very specific KYC requirements and you can do some amazing stuff on the blockchain if you're a German citizen that you cannot do anywhere else in the yeah, world right. because they figured out a regulatory environment. Right. Jeremy. Hi. Um, the whole decentralization, centralization issue, isn't that the geopolitical battle of the future of a centralized <laughs> society like yeah. China and loyalty, loyalty scores and things like that versus the decentralized? And I think it's critical that the U.S. tries to stay decentralized. I'm just curious, what world would you guys want to live in? And, and you know, what's your take on sort of this? I think that's the battle of the future. I, you know, I can say as a, as a person who emigrated out of India to the US, the, one of the reasons I did is because of the fact that I can choose my own destiny, right? The 1776, the whole idea about crypto is as American as it can be. And I think 
it's at the core of decentralization. Uh, that's the world I want to live in. So, I mean, it's my answer. I, guess I want to live in a world where it is appropriately regulated, not where it is completely unregulated. I don't, I don't really want to live in a completely Mad Max hellscape. I'd rather know that, I'd rather know movie, that my house deed is on the blockchain that I'm, I have some property rights that I can enforce. So I think some level of regulation is appropriate. How do you feel about the U.S. government dealing with digital currencies? I, they, I, they're thinking about it right now. So digital, so central bank digital currencies are, are only related to cryptocurrency by media people. Right. They really don't have anything to do with each other. Um, a, a digital currency in the U.S. would be very helpful for a lot of things that we want to do with fiat. It has nothing to do with what's going on in the crypto ecosystem, in my opinion. Right. Can't but, lose it. Can't fall out of your wallet. Right. I mean, you've already you've already covered, you know, one of the main ways that, you know, you're, 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 you you drop your wallet in the airport, you lose it all there. Well, you can't really drop your crypto wallet, per se, unless you have it on like a hardware or something like that. But. I don't think CBDC should become a reality. That's all I'm going to I'm say. with you there. I don't like yeah. it. I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like it. So this is just reminding me, everyone in the room and everyone hopefully knows we, we're here in a special place here in the Berkshires because we have a long history of this. We were been printing U.S. currency for, <laughs> I don't know, Doug, how long? <laughs> uh, but we have more fun making beer. <laughs> So we're gonna have a few more questions and then I wanna make sure everyone is able to enjoy um, some of what Shire made for us. And um, uh, is there any more in the, in the crowd here? Yeah. yeah uh, so on the theme of bringing digital assets into the legacy financial services system, um, can you provide any examples or any resources do some further research on, on how asset managers are giving their clients a direct exposure digital assets and cryptocurrencies as opposed to like using a traditional brokerage system IRAs and using like, e like futures ETFs. Yeah, at the moment, the short answer is the regulators are so far behind the ball that virtually nothing is crossing that bridge. Um, I spend most of my life trying to find places to build those bridges, and right now they they just don't exist. The closest thing we have is a handful of futures-based products that are not particularly useful for anyone, um, and so. The short answer is right now, if you want to work and explore and invest in the crypto ecosystem, whether it's NFTs or individual coins or individual projects, you got to do that over here. That you cannot cross that boundary. And that makes it a real problem for just basic portfolio management. How do you rebalance between your crypto wallet and your Schwab account, right? There are real issues there that are not solved yet. Um, so the short answer is the regulators are really keeping us from getting where we need to be. And it's probably going to be 18 months before we get anywhere close to relief on it. So there's there's actually a little bit of progress on there. So so Paul's in the back. Paul's with Willow. Um, Paul's a financial advisor. We just started, a you know, actually a, a really exciting project with them. Uh, Paul does separately managed accounts. So he will he, you give him money like your 401k and he will and, you know do the same risk analysis, have the same conversation with you on it. And that is the first step in actually doing this. And again, 2030, it's going to be you're going to have your, you know, S&P 500 and your your Bitcoin, you know, spot ETF or whatever the case is at that point there, but it is here and it's it's not that you, I mean, I don't know, there's, there's a lot of different ways you can invest. It's whatever, you know, whatever floats your boat. Some people want to play options. Some people want to buy, you know, the safest things and not look at it there. Well, it's, it's going to be managed by people that job is to manage it. And it is coming. It's already here. Steven. Most industries start off totally decentralized. Like the automotive industry, there are hundreds of companies that are consolidated to three companies. And uh, <clears throat> And, and even just uh, open source, it was sort of everywhere. And then companies like, Red like Hat. AOL and Yahoo, whenever it started coming in, started charging you for all these things or whatever. But the question, and even though it's like the, the alcohol business, it was all these, you know, micro breweries, they weren't called them then. Then they became the big breweries. Then they become the micro breweries. They get bought out by the big breweries. So is this going to be the same thing that at some point, I mean, it's, it's also like, a, is, is at some point is like even like Red Hat who came in and basically is making money also for free thing, which I never really, so I, so I guess I'm wondering, and I go back also, one more thing, is like, if, you, if you look at the, um, I'm trying to know who's making the money on this. If you go to the, to the gold rush, where the people looking for gold made no money, or some people did, and the people made the money, the people made sandwiches and picks and shovels. And so the question is, where is the money? And what's gonna happen in the layer on top of it who says, 
I don't understand how to understand my uh, mortgage, so I need someone to help me figure it out if I'm going to manage it by myself. Just seems like this. I'm not sure where the money is, um, and it's probably not at the lowest level. It's probably that middle level that understands it, explains it, and helps people manage it. It just means it's shifting from the big companies to some other big company. I, I don't. I got heard you said a couple. I just don't understand. Maybe I'm just like showing my age, but I don't, I don't get where the money is here. Um, and, and so any thoughts about this this issue of at some point it's going to consolidate and then come out again unless this is like totally new world and things will consolidate in this world. I guess consolidation also comes with the territory of regulation, right? right. Sometimes you put up barriers to entry. Um, so, so far it's been permissionless, so anyone can in innovate. Um, so Bitcoin was the biggest one, Ethereum came, then came Solano, there's so many different networks. You can start your own tomorrow, <laughs> which is completely possible. Uh, the question is success, viability of your project, right? Of your coin. So centralization um, uh, will happen again, like you said, but then I think as long as we don't have regulations that prevent other people from innovating, I believe that we will continue to have more and more uh, projects coming out of the world and potentially remain as decentralized as it is right now. Yeah, I agree. Regulation is what will determine that. Right? Yeah. Part of the reason we saw the consolidation we saw in just raw internet technology was largely around regulation, right? We made it too expensive for people to play the old way anymore. Right. You now needed to have access to lobbyists and everything else just to be able to run a decent internet sized business. Mm -hmm. Same thing's gonna happen in crypto. And that's why I spent a lot of time worried about regulation because appropriate regulation would put America ahead of this for the next 50 years. Bad regulation is gonna mean we're a third world country. And there's there there is the consolidation does happen in crypto. You know, I can use an example. You know, there's a uh, there's challenges with Ethereum. Everybody loves it, but it's slow and expensive. So there's been a lot of projects made that are specifically designed to operate with the same constraints that Ethereum does, but faster and cheaper. So Polygon is one. Uh, they need to interact with Ethereum to be safe, but they want to kind of do their own thing and, and be very efficient with it. So there's some inefficiencies there. And they were like, we're going to develop an algorithm that exploits that. It makes it really good. And then they took a long time and then they bought a company that had developed it because the difference between Ethereum, the network, and the, 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 the application itself, the application is a company. There are software developers that get paid. Uh, you know, by salary or by, you know, by whatever incentive it is, you know, whether it's on a network or, or you know, a traditional salary case there, you can buy those projects there. There are applications that you use, you know, Hermes is the one that I'm referring to here. They got bought for like a quarter billion dollars. And it's because they developed technology that this network needed. And, and so that will happen. It'll continue to happen because again, the companies that create the tokens that operate the network, they own a lot of those tokens. And so as the network gets more use, the value goes up and they can spend those just like we spend money it's fixing shovels it's the yep. internet in 1995 yep well and then with uh you know with bitcoin the sec has decided has at least for the time being and it has come up several times they've decided that it's not a security that can be regulated and that is because par partially because it's not operated by any central authority so they are going to be take a hands-off approach if it's not you know centralized and and that who, who do you slap on the wrist if somebody yeah. if something bad happens? You're just like you don't go hit all the Bitcoin miners because you don't know who they are. Yeah, the, the regulations are really funny because you look at these senators and congressmen interviewing people in like oh. Facebook, and oh, man. questions are like, I want them to create regulations. No. It's, yeah. you know, crazy. I'm not super optimistic. <laughs> that that is the fear. That is the driving reason behind decentralization. Yeah. Is that question? Yeah. Is you have you have? I mean, you look at the age of everybody on Congress, right? I mean, they're not. I'm not hanging out with them. How do they know what I'm interested in and what the world's going to look like? And they're making policies that will not move the needle for 10 years because the big wheel turns slow. They'll probably be dead in 10 years. So like, I don't trust them to do it. At the same time, you know, you mentioned before like the freelance coders and stuff like that. There's people far smarter about software technology than you know the collective sum of you know most of the people you're meeting in your life out there and they can do some really dirty stuff that, that's really hard to find and the happy medium is something that lets you know as, as chet said you know innovation be free but put up walls where they need to be you know we don't want the we don't want a, a totally permissionless marketplace across the world there but you gotta let you know you gotta let scientists do science you gotta let you know traders trade you gotta let all that kind of stuff happen and i mean who knows what it'll turn into there you know like like dave said you know it, it could go really bad or really good and we'll see Oh, we got one more here. Yeah, um, this is my very first introduction to this, other than what I've seen in the news or on Facebook. And it sounds 
one thing that comes to mind is it sounds too good to be true. It usually is. <laughs> and then the other thing is, wow, huge returns. Uh, somebody makes enough money to buy seven different restaurants in one town. And <laughs> <laughs> okay, so am I, I would have small amounts to start to invest. A, can you start with a small amount? B, is there a facilitator, broker, not a, whatever, to uh, take my money and turn turn it into fabulous. <laughs> you got to stand up when you say fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Paul, I mean, right, you have one sitting in the back of the room here. That's what Paul does for a living. And it's a 20% return on $10 is, you know, if I'm investing $10, that $10 probably means a lot more to me than someone that, that has $100,000 in their account. So percentage returns are great. There's a stable coin, which I mean, there's a lot of tech stuff here, but these are always kind of worth a dollar that you can just put away that will give you 20% returns you know and stop. How do you know it's going to because the the code forces it to do it's an algorithm and you can look at the algorithm the way that it distributes rewards it increments them and stuff like that 20 percent forever no savings account do it could it be crypto. like a pyramid Pyra yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah there, there are yeah there are there are pyramids with it but you know there's 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 ponzi schemes that that well, well, no, wait, who, so you're, you're, guarantees nobody, that. Yeah, nobody, guarantees, nobody guarantees it. Nobody guarantees it. Yeah, there's no one to hold account <laughs> for it. The code guarantees it, but you don't want to be the last one but there's yeah. trying nobody, to get in There's no there. SIPC standing behind it. There is no federal deposit insurance company standing behind it. And they, they go, and, and so that, 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 that's a terrific point because, you know, how do you entice people to do that if there's no one to hold accountable? And so they do that with collateral backing. You know, the, the company that does this UST, for example, bought $10 billion in Bitcoin to say, well, we can back it because we have cash. Like we have physical things that everybody agrees have value there. And so it's a risk proposition like everything else. I mean, someone could unplug the internet. To, I mean, I guess you can't really unplug the internet, but, but hypo, you know, in, in figurative terms, you could unplug the internet and then nothing works, right? So. So start small and don't don't risk more than you can. Risk. Yeah, consider it speculation. Yeah, right? it's all because speculation. Yeah, it's very it's very reasonable to think of all of this as speculative right now because it's changing so fast. Not because it's all going to zero. Speculation isn't a bad word. It just means there are a lot of unknowns. And there's companies that come in and out of existence, you know, stuff, you know, you look at Yahoo, right? You know, one of the top you know, hundred companies in the world, I don't even know where they are anymore. I mean, I think I know some people with the Yahoo email and things will come and go, right? I mean, that's about it. And, and, you know, having, having an advisor, um, I mean, is the best way to do it. If you don't want to self custody, again, the word terrifying comes in, you know, you want to, you want to get started, right? You need a crypto wallet and you got to get money in, you got to send it to a number. How do I know that's my number? That's scary. That stuff is really hard. So we, we try to write a lot about that stuff on our website for the tech geeks there, but go, you know, go talk to Paul, go talk to a financial advisor and, and they'll, they'll help you out with it. All right. I got one more from home. Uh, Ellen Boyd asks, and maybe this will tie into uh, what you were saying about Germany before. Um, are there any other countries that are more advanced in crypto than here in the U S yeah, all of the EU. All of them. Yeah. <laughs> Singapore, I, I mean, Singapore so, well, yeah. so effectively pl places that are sub jurisdictional, meaning like if you are, like in sub-Saharan Africa, you can get away with pretty much anything. Um, the the reality is that in terms of proactive, positive regulatory environment, the EU is the, the probably the best I've seen. There are plenty of countries that are doing really interesting stuff like El Salvador, <laughs> right? There are places that are really trying to go all in on a crypto future. That's very different than being an environment you might necessarily want to be investing in or from. Um, I think the EU's approach here has been pretty solid. That's scary. I mean, like I, that, you know, Bitcoin enthusiasts, right? Sitting, you know, we, we all love this stuff there. Like, you know, Bitcoin crashes, can't pay the military. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that one. Yeah. All right, we got one from Michael Coakley. So how do people get started in crypto? I want to be an investor in crypto. How do I go about doing that? Education, learning about it. Yeah. I would say start with learning education. Make, making sure you understand that what you're doing before you do anything. You are taking one. step one right here tonight, Michael. Yeah. You are educating <laughs> yourself. Seriously. There, are, there are so many great research. I mean, your site's got some great stuff on right. it. We write about it once in a while. CoinDesk is a, is a particularly popular site that covers it more from a news angle day yeah. to day. Um, come, uh, there's a company called OnRamp that works yeah, with financial great. advisors that does fantastic crypto education. Yeah. Um, I've worked with them a lot. Uh, Masari, there's, you know, in our stuff, Masari, you know, coin, I mean, there's, there's no, there, there, there's no shortage of places to look, you can, you can look up there. Now, is it good interest information or not? I, I don't know. I won't, won't comment on that, but you know, it's, it's the same as a stock, right? You're not just going to go invest your life savings into, you know, uh, it, you know, AMD or something like that without, 
doing a little research on it there, right? You should, you know, otherwise you want to get a spread of assets and find a mutual fund or something. So again, you know, assess your own risk and yeah, learn, you got to learn. So what are the downsides of Greystone, uh, Grayscale investments? Oh dear. Ridiculously um, high fees. I'm happy to have a sidebar <laughs> yeah. conversation about that. It's, it's not actually an ETF. It's a closed end fund trust that's traded on the pink sheets. Um, I wouldn't, I mean, I know those guys, I think they do good work. I think the structure is very problematic. Yeah. So um, as I said at the outset, the um, it's great to see everyone here. The BIC was built to be a center for thought leadership. And I really just want to thank our panelists here and, and all our participants in the audience and at home for, for joining us. Again, to our sponsor, Synegex, Pittsfield Co-op, uh, Shire, let's go out and have a, have a beer. Jimny and our friend Ryan Salami. And Hamilton Salami. Brooks, Smith and Reynolds. This is what I wanted to get to now. And uh, as you guys were checking in, you saw uh, Hamilton Brooks, Smith and Reynolds um, donated a really lovely uh, gift basket. I hope I'm the winner. But Tim, do you know who actually is the winner? Uh, yes, the winner of the gift basket is Steve Michaelek. Hey, hey yeah. Steve. So. Also, I just remembered it was the two monkeys and the cunning fox. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so join us outside, please. First beer is on Steve. And thank you guys very much. Thanks to everyone at home. That was great.